Listen to this letter of the 22nd of March of 1429. Jesu Maria, King of England, and you, Duke of Bedford, who call yourself Regent of the Kingdom of France, render your account to the King of Heaven. Render to the maid who is sent here from God, the King of Heaven, the keys to all the good cities that you have taken and violated in France. She has come here from God to proclaim the blood royal. She is entirely ready to make peace if you are willing to settle accounts with her, provided that you give up France and pay for having occupied her. And those among you, archers, companions at arm, gentlemen, and others who are before the city of Orléans, go back to your own countries for God's sake. And if you do not do so, wait for the word of the maid who will come visit you briefly to your great damage. If you do not do so, I am the commander of the armies, and in whatever place I shall meet your French allies, I shall make them leave it. Whether they wish to leave it or not, if they do not obey, I shall have them all killed. I am sent from God, King of Heaven, to chase you all out of France, body for body, every last one of you. And if they wish to obey, I will have mercy on them and have no other opinion for you shall never hold the kingdom of France from God and heaven because the son of St. Mary does not wish it. King Charles, the true heir, will hold it. For God, king of heaven, wishes it so and has revealed this through the maid and he will enter Paris with goodly company. If you do not wish to believe this message from God through the maid, then wherever we find you, we will strike you and make great uproar, greater than any ever made in France for a thousand years if you do not come to terms. And believe firmly that the God of heaven will give the maid more force than you will ever know how to achieve with all your assaults on her and all your good men of arms. In the exchange of blows, we shall see who has better right from the king of heaven. You, Duke of Bedford, the may praise you and request that you cause no more destruction. If you will settle your account, you can come and join her company, in which the French will achieve the finest feat ever accomplished in Christendom. And give answer if you wish to make peace in the city of Orléans. And if indeed you do not do so, be mindful of your great damages. Written on Tuesday of Holy Week. How did a young 19-year-old peasant girl get to this point? Who were her French? How could she imagine going to battle against other Christians? How did she dare write with such authority and with many demands to the Duke of Bedford, uncle of the king, son of the king, a possible heir to the throne, and thus potentially Joan's king, as well as superior. I'm interested now in turning to the lives from the great spiritual and secular women's lives of the 12th century to look at this life and death and the cultural reception of the amazing Joan of Arc as she seemed to her contemporaries, as she is represented by great artists in later time, and as she is still evoked in religious, political, and military struggles. Joan is, I think, about the best strictly historical person documented in more than 15,000 literary, musical, and graphic works, to say nothing of movies. About the best documented person in Western civilization until very modern times. Joan was an enigma in her own time, and to her enemies, she was a scandal a stumbling block even to many of her friends, supporters, and allies. She was very young to presume to do the things she did. She was probably born in 1412, some say on January 6th, the feast day of the Epiphany, popularly known as the Day of the Kings. And she was burned at the stake on May 30th, aged something like 19. Before that, she became, in the awestruck words of Mark Twain, an American author and civil, rights, a civil war deserter who came very close to understanding Joan, I think. She was, according to Twain, 
the youngest person of either sex to lead her nation's army before the age of 19. What were the dominant issues of Joan's day? This is a world very different from the exciting, intellectually energized world of the 12th century. Joan's historical moment was shaped by two major, long-lasting European crises, which I should sketch out, however briefly, before going on with Joan's story. First of all, the crown of France was in dispute for over 100 years in what is conventionally known as the Hundred Years' War, which stretched from 1337 to 1453. This controversy had its roots in century-long disputes about the limits of authority between the crown of France and the several great principalities that made up that kingdom. Some say that the dispute began with the marriage of Henry II, Henry Plantagenet, to Eleanor of Aquitaine, and therefore the persisting split in the lands between the French claims to the crown and the English claims to the crown. It then became, after the time of Eleanor and Henry, and it remained, a succession crisis between two closely related royal dynasties, the Plantagenets on the one hand, whom we know through Henry, and the Valois on the other hand. This dynastic rivalry was aggravated by the ambitions of the House of Burgundy, the very rich, sophisticated Burgundian dukes, who were closely related to both of the other dynasties, the Valois and the Plantagenets. And the war among these factions was fought in four phases. We usually call them the first phase of 1337 to 60, and 1364 to 80, 1413 to 29, and finally 1430 to 1453. Eventually, the Valois dynasty retained its hold on the crown of France, and the French nation was born, as was the English nation, whose Plantagenet kings remained in control until the coming of the Tudors. The famous bloody battle of Agincourt in 1415, when Joan was merely three, seemed to give real substance to the English hopes of placing all of France under Plantagenet control. At Agincourt, you will remember, Eleanor and Henry's descendant in the eighth generation, the young Hal, Prince Hal of Shakespeare's play, obliterated the French forces. In making peace in the Treaty of Troyes in 1420 by marrying the French Princess Catherine, daughter of Isabel and Charles VI, that is, by taking a war bride. Henry thought his children would have huge lands and real peace, that the kingdoms of England and France would be fully merged. But there was a small impediment, the French male royal line. And once more, as we were with Eleanor, as we knew this story, from the very beginning with Abelard rejecting his own family inheritance, we come to the question of female inheritance, of male lines of primogeniture, and the issues between France and England were very largely questions of whether, by melding two lines in which, therefore, the woman would be seen as the heir to France, it was going to be possible to achieve peace. Henry thought so. Unfortunately, Charles and all of his brothers thought not in France. Joan of Arc's brief intervention, her supporters insisted and still insist, gave France, that is, those whom we call the Valois faction, otherwise known as the French, or the Armagnacs, just as their enemies were popularly known as the Burgundians and the English, so for the sheer sake of simplicity in these lectures, I will be referring to the Anglo-Burgundians or the English and to those whom we think of as the Armagnacs and the Valois as the French. It is inexact to do so, although Joan herself did so. It is inexact to do so because it is impossible by bloodline or by language to say that these were entirely different people. 
The French were the English and the English were the French at the level of nobility and especially at the level of royalty. These were all each other's cousins. They were in and out of each other's courts. They lived and breathed the same literary traditions. So for us to separate them as firmly as we do is historically anachronistic. But let us remember how Joan thought about them, the English and the French. Victory came finally to the French in the fourth phase, in the third phase, because of Joan's intervention at Orleans. And that made the fourth phase of this war merely a protracted mopping up operation. In general European and world terms, this sporadic but protracted war put an end to the medieval chivalric warfare as we knew it and began the spiral of military atrocity that is not yet terminated in Europe and the rest of the world. As such, it engaged not simply the warrior population, but the whole population of France, subjecting what had been Europe's most prosperous and peaceful kingdom to a diet of nearly daily horror. The French never invaded England, remember, but the English forces were extremely violent in their pursuit of the French throne. This is where people like Joan's family became crucial to the future as well as to their own moment. It's very important to remember how badly France had suffered by the time Joan entered the story. As recently as one century before this, France had seemed to be the ideal Christian nation. Its prosperity and its peace under an unbroken dynasty of kings who dispensed justice rather than oppression seemed to many a sign of divine approval for the mores of the French. Yet almost all of the fighting of the Hundred Years' War took place in France, and the vast majority of the casualties were French people. The ferocity of the conflict banished the restraints of chivalric warfare, which for centuries had sought profitable prisoners rather than mere bloodshed. Between major campaigns, companies of mercenary soldiers in the Hundred Years' War made easy, pleasurable livings from pillage, rape, and the indiscriminate slaughter of a population that had lost the habit of self-defense under the long Capetian peace. Fair France, as it was called in the days of Charlemagne. Fair France had not been so savage since the time of the Vikings, five centuries before. And the devastation spread beyond the kingdom's borders into Spain, Italy, and Germany. Those who see Joan of Arc as an improbable saint, given her conviction that God had sent her to lead the armies of one Christian nation against another Christian nation have generally not taken into account the dimensions of misery suffered by the common people of France and some neighboring countries because of that endless and pitiless war. For some of a radically populous temper, Joan's mission seems entirely valid in larger spiritual terms, something of a model for modern movements of popular resistance to colonial oppression. It is hard to imagine what it was like to be a young girl growing up knowing that those who resisted the Duke of Burgundy and his followers were sometimes brought to open fields, forced to open up graves for themselves, and buried alive. There was yet another crisis in France at that time, or in the world at that time. From 1378 to 1450, 15, there were two, and then from 1409 to 1415, three popes claiming to be the authentic pope of Christianity. This was and is known as the Great Schism. The causes and formal issues of this division are very complicated, but largely irrelevant to the world of Joan of Arc. What is relevant is that ordinary Christians became terribly confused as one pope excommunicated his opponents and all their followers. Therefore, who could tell who was the rightful pope? 
and therefore who had been condemned to hell. We want to remember where this was, what, in what it was rooted. One of the victories of King Philip IV of France was the humiliation of the papacy in the person of Pope Boniface VIII from 1294 to 1303, who died after escaping from a detachment of French troops who had come to arrest him in Italy. Boniface's successor, an archbishop at Bordeaux who took the name of Clement, seconded Philip's major religious policy. He annulled his predecessor's offensive acts, confirmed Philip's destruction of the Knights Templar, and in 1309 moved the permanent residence of the popes from Rome to Avignon, which was a papal city on the Rhone River directly opposite the Kingdom of France. Public opinion in much of the rest of Europe was consistently distressed, sometimes outraged, by that surrender of the papacy's ancient role and symbolic seat in Rome, so much so that the papacy returned to Rome in 1376 among the general rejoicing of all, including those in France. But two years after the return, a disputed election split the papacy again. One line of popes claimed exclusive legitimacy and they remained in Rome. Another line claimed the legitimacy and they returned to Avignon. In 1409, a pope council met in Pisa and they produced not resolution, but a third claimant. This stubborn scandal was resolved only in 1415, thanks to a major alteration in the constitution of the church. The recognition of a broadly representative general council as finally superior to the office of the pope. Therefore, the restored Roman papacy, headed by a native Roman of ancient lineage, Martin V, committed itself to undercutting this innovation of church councils at every turn. During the years of the schism, the English king and parliament had supported the Roman pope, at least partly because the French kings supported the Avignon pope. Since Scotland was determined to remain independent of English pressure, the Scots supported the Avignon claimant as well. And you found parallel situations throughout all of, of Christendom. The Avignon and Roman popes excommunicated each other, their rivals, their rivals' supporters, thus denying them the sacraments of the true church. But as I said before, how could one tell who was the true claimant? Who was the pope who was the valid dispenser of the sacraments? One apocalyptic preacher even claimed to have been shown in a vision that no one had entered heaven since the great schism began. Some of the best minds and the most idealistic spirits of European society committed their hopes of, to form or reform to this scandal of the church as a whole to the institution of a general council. It was thought to be a good thing to have a general council to solve these issues. One such council, attended by thousands of clerics and laymen from every province and interest group in Christendom, met at the city of Constance in the Upper Rhine between 1414 and 1417. Another met later at Basel. In these councils, the intellectual leadership was provided by the University of Paris, who were overwhelmingly in favor of conciliar reform. Not surprisingly, the majority of that university's faculty also supported the Plantagenet claimant to the crown of, throne, of, of France. A dual monarch would be less likely to interfere in matters of the church were he busier with matters of the state. Edward III had shown by way his cultivation of the English Parliament during long and popular reign so that his young and insecure great-great-grandson Henry VI clearly would go even further, the partisans of the University of Paris thought, in ruling his French kingdom through the councils, the Estates General, an institution that tended for good reason to make the Valois kings nervous. Why do we want to know this background about the Great Schism? Because those who thought they could interfere and solve the problem were the great councils of the church who were backed up by and manipulated by the intellectual powers at the University of Paris. Those powers favored the side of the English and wanted to undercut the force of the Valois, wanted to undercut the traditional powers of the French kings. And in that, we can see the later alignments of those who were the trial judges of, the, of Joan of Arc 
those trial judges who came from or were appointed by the University of Paris. So what is relevant for ordinary Christians is that they were very confused about these matters of the Great Schism and the Hundred Years' War. What we know, however, is that there were serious questions for all Christians about whether there was a rightful pope and who had been condemned to hell. Some preachers even claimed visions, as I said, saying that no one had entered heaven since the Great Schism began, and this was therefore a time of extraordinarily high anxiety in terms of all forms of institutional life. The state seemed radically unsure and insecure. The church was radically unsure and insecure. Who then was going to have clarity? Many were those in this time who were visionaries, and the power of the visionaries really increased in Joan's own lifetime. Joan herself was only a peasant of solid peasant stock and behavior. Her family itself was seemingly normal, but the family as a whole was more upwardly mobile than was the norm. Her family was quite respectable in the village of Domremy. Her father tended to be chosen by his fellow visit villagers to act more or less as their mayor when the circumstances called for it. Her father was called Jacques d'Arc, D-A-R-C, as her name should probably be spelled. And he was frequently chosen to be the leader and speaker of the village. Her mother, Isabel Rome, the pilgrim, Isabel the pilgrim, was a committed homemaker who also had the leisure, either before or and during her marriage, to go on pilgrimages, which is why she's known as the one who's been to Rome. Joan would have been known to her neighbors as Jean Rome. That is how naming patterns worked in that part of France. Her more distant relatives were successful in rural life, and the whole family was more mobile than was true of most families. And she had an uncle, for instance, who was a village priest. But they were all peasants with no provable noble or bourgeois connections. Joan was furthermore illiterate, as was typical for her class, her sex, and her age. After Joan got him crowned at Reims, King Charles VII made Joan and all of her relatives and their legitimate descendants noble forever. And they were assigned a coat of arms. But before that, they were peasants, pure and simple. Now, some have found this fact, peasants, so astounding, perhaps intolerable, that they have decided Joan was, in fact, a royal bastard raised by the local dark family. This is a very medieval way of thinking. Heroic deeds can be performed only with those of noble or better blood. And a lot of ink has been spilled trying to prove or disprove this thesis. I think in many respects it's easier for modern Americans, those of us who came from nowhere and made something of the world, to credit the apparent facts of this issue. Joan was a peasant who rose to power. As I said, Joan and her family were ordinary but devout. In their testimony at her post-death trial, her fe fellow villagers described her over and over again as just like everybody else, with one exception. The exception, as Régine Pernou pointed out to us, was how willingly she did everything she had to do. She was always willing to do everything. Her life was full of normal village activities. She tended the cows, not sheep. She was not a shepherdess, as one sees in the movies, and did a lot of things that peasant girls had to do. She went to festivals. She attended church activities. She had abnormally obedient relationships with her family and lots of warm friendships with boys as well as with girls. Joan was also illiterate, a serious inconvenience even in the Middle Ages. She did learn to write her name during her year, her really four months of triumph, and the neat letters of her signature suggest her joy at being able to write it. Some, including the great French historian Régine Pernou, are inclined to suspect that she learned to read a little bit during her five-month trial, but that is at best a guess. How could an illiterate peasant girl begin to comprehend the complex issues of politics, diplomacy, and law, which impinged upon her constantly during the two years of her public life. It is hard for educated people, especially professors, to begin imagining such a thing. It was hard for their 15th century predecessors, especially professors, as well. And Joan was also a girl.
an illiterate young peasant girl. Her case gets stranger and stranger, more and more implausible the more we know about it. This illiterate young peasant girl, she always called herself a girl, La Pucelle. She referred to herself as the one who was the virgin, the girl. Insistently, she was never a woman. She was never a dame. She lived and died La Pucelle. She came from the farthest eastern frontier of France, from a region predominantly loyal to the Burgundian, that is, the English faction, opposed to the Dauphin. She got crowned in France. Domremy was on the river Meuse, the border between Champagne, which is part of the French kingdom, and Lorraine, which was still part of the German or Holy Roman Empire. John's dialect, more typical of Lorraine than, than of Champagne, marked her out when she went to the heart of France. Why should such a person care, someone who is a frontiers person, about an old dispute being fought out at the center of France? How much of it could she understand? A parallel from American history suggests that frontiersmen make some of the best patriots. Ask any Texan. In fact, in Joan's time, the French king's most stalwart partisans tended to live in the extreme south of the kingdom, close to Spain. Some of them were called Armagnacs, which is where we get that notion of the Armagnac group, which is the French group. Most amazingly, this illiterate peasant girl from the frontier achieved remarkable military victories and showed a strategic as well as a tactical sense that won the respect of hardened military veterans. There are four prime examples, the first of which was her morale and tactical victory in the raising of the siege of Orléans in early May of 1429, which was then the key place geographically and geopolitically in the Hundred Years' War. The second was her open field victory at Pate on June 18th of 1429, which was a minor reverse of Agincourt with high casualties for the English and practically none for the French. The third was her strategic daring in penetrating deep behind enemy lines to get Charles the Dauphin crowned king at Reims, that key symbolic event of that final phase of the war. And the fourth was her uncanny understanding of artillery tactics, something it takes older commanders a while to learn. And this was all done by someone who was distressed by the sight of bloodshed. A fifth would have been her taking of Paris on August in 1429, which any modern strategist sees as obvious and manageable if the suddenly cautious king, duped by the Duke of Burgundy, had committed to this attack the minimum forces necessary to achieve it. But he didn't, so the attack failed, discrediting Joan in the eyes of many, even though she failed. She was right. It was the right place to go. It would have ended the war right then. Most contemporary field commanders were firmly convinced that Joan's military expertise was either a divine miracle or witchcraft. That's why the English faction had to get her tried and burned at Rouen in May of 1430. What sense can we make of all these facts about Joan, which we will revisit? Joan won her goal. Some modern historians dismiss her as an incomprehensible quirk. Others think she changed the course of European, indeed of world history. And so the debate about her goes on. The debate ought to be easier to resolve, but has in fact been aggravated by the fact that Joan is one of the best documented figures in all human history. Because of the amazingly detailed and lovingly preserved transcripts of her two famous trials, as well as the explosions of information about her in contemporary reports, we know more historically about her short life than we do about the life of Jesus Christ, Julius Caesar, Plato, Alexander the Great, Charlemagne, or anyone who lived after her or before her, but for perhaps for at least two or three more centuries after her. Joan has generated many legends, but we can and should dispense with many of them. In our subsequent lectures, we will think about how Joan became visible to her king and her country,
how she waged war, how she lost battles, how she was captured, tried, and found guilty. She was burned at the stake. Then we'll see how she was resurrected years later and her innocence reaffirmed until her story moved beyond time, culminating in the 20th century with her final trial, this time to prove authoritatively to those who needed such proof that she had been and remained a saint.